The Golden Temple in Amritsar, India, is the spiritual home of Sikhism, the youngest of the world's great religions. Each morning, Sikhs gather here to worship and bathe in the sacred waters. Sikhism started with one man in the 15th century. And today there are 20 million adherents of Sikhism around the world. Clearly, there's a dynamic in these people. Otherwise, they couldn't have survived for 500 years against the most astonishing odds we they faced. Um, Invaders, wars, conflicts, persecution, repression, everything and the book was thrown at them. And yet they came out of it stronger, better, more self-confident. Orthodox Sikhs are among the most distinctive and recognizable religious groups in the world. But despite this exclusive appearance, Sikhism is founded on firm principles of tolerance and equality. Sikhism is perhaps one of the most universal of all religions in the world. It does not recognize any distinctions on the basis of caste, creed, color, race. It guarantees gender equality. It recognizes people on the basis of their actions. But there is another powerful strain in Sikhism, its martial tradition. India's British rulers recognized this, placing Sikhs in the vanguard of the imperial army. A devout Sikh is never parted from their sword. This merging of the spiritual and the militant took place with the creation of the Khalsa, the sacred order of the Sikhs, whose flag with its twin swords flies high over Amritsar. April 1999 marks the 300th anniversary of the first Khalsa initiation, an event which still defines the ideals and identity of Sikhs across the globe. Sikhism first emerged some 500 years ago in an area of northwest India called the Punjab, the land of the five rivers. The region had seen turbulent times with foreign armies passing through as they invaded India. Yet for thousands of years the Punjab has remained largely unchanged, the rural home of farming people. And it was in a typical farming community that the founder of Sikhism, Guru Nanak, was born in 1469. Guru Nanak didn't write very much about himself. He lived through the crack up of one empire, the Lodhis, and the invasion by the Mughals who set up the following empire. He talks of troublous times, but his own uh, life story is still a little incomplete. Guru Nanak's father probably owned a little land. He was able to educate his son modestly in Persian and Sanskrit. He was married off very young, but his mind was not on either business or uh, rearing a family. It was really spiritual pursuits that he was after. Nanak had been born a Hindu into India's main religious tradition dating back thousands of years. Hinduism emphasized multiple gods, rituals and a rigid social hierarchy of different castes. But the invaders who now ruled India were Muslims. They believed in a single god and actively sought convert to Islam. Nanak saw good in both religions, but believed they'd become caught up in bad practices. While Martin Luther was busy changing the course of religion in Europe, Nanak brought about a reformation of his own in the Punjab. As a teacher or guru, he attracted plenty of devoted students, or to use the Punjabi word, Sikhs. Where Guru Nanak scored over other religious teachers of his time was that he spoke in the language of the people, the common people, the peasantry and the tradespeople. <laughs>
At the core of Guru Nanak's teachings is a single God who is both universal and personal. Guru Nanak's concept of God, in fact, is contained in the sixth morning prayer, the Japji. The Japji opens with the phrase Ikumkar. This, in essence, contains Guru Nanak's idea of God and his message to mankind that there is one sole supreme being. He is the creator of the universe. He is omnipresent. He is immanent. He is without fear, without rancor. He is formless. And in fact, according to Guru Nanak, God resides within each one of us. Guru Nanak's belief that God could be reached directly and simply was reflected in his love of musical worship. Guru Nanak was essentially a poet. But Guru Nanak didn't see the religious life as just being about inward-looking contemplation. His teachings had a strong practical basis. Sikhism was about living in the real world with its commitment to social and religious equality. Guru Nanak's thinking was extraordinarily um, ahead of his time. 500 years ahead of what we are talking about today, for like gender equality and so on. He was well ahead of his time in the sense that he felt, and the two gurus who succeeded him, that women should have completely equal rights with men. And to give it specific form to this idea, this concept of equal rights, the uh, widows were allowed to remarry, which was not unheard of. Women priests were ordained, and the uh, wearing of the uh, veil was stopped. The Sikh ideal of equality is most clearly demonstrated in the langar, the free kitchen, attached to each Sikh temple or gurdwara. The biggest langar is at the Golden Temple, where thousands of free meals are served every hour to anyone who comes, regardless of their background or beliefs. Different people sat together and cooked for each other and ate together. Now this had to do again with doing away with the pernicious um, caste distinctions, that an upper caste can't be ever seen, perish the thought, sitting with a lower caste and eating, leave alone even getting touched by him and so on. Don't withdraw from the daily life, but still, your concerns should be rooted in an ethical framework. After a life spent teaching and traveling throughout India and the East, Guru Nanak died in 1539, having appointed a successor to carry on his work. Guru Angad was the second of a series of gurus. He was followed by Guru Amar Das, who founded the site which eventually became the Golden Temple. The fourth Guru, Ram Das, developed the site, but it was the fifth Guru, Arjun, who built the first temple in 1588. But Arjun's guruship also saw another key event in the history of Sikhism as he came into conflict with India's Muslim Emperor Jahangir. It is when the Sikh church spread, or temples were built all around the countryside, and wealth started accumulating, that the Sikh guru became, apart from a teacher, a rich person, a personage in his own rights. And that begins with the fifth guru, Guru Arjun. And uh, the emperor realized that he'd become too powerful. He was arrested, uh, taken to Lahore, tortured, and martyred. And from then on, the conflict never ceased. The Sikhs now took up arms under Arjun's son and successor, Guru Hargobind. 
The seventh guru, Har Rai, and the eighth, the child guru, Har Krishan, presided over more peaceful times. But in 1675, the ninth guru, Teg Bahadur, again incurred the wrath of the Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb, by defending Hindu religious rights. His subsequent execution had a lasting impact. Martyrdom has a special place in the Sikh psyche. It was the fifth guru, then the ninth guru, Teg Bahadur, who were both executed by the rulers. Uh, thereafter, there's a whole line of martyrs. Uh, to die for the faith is to die a noble death. And I think that has continued right from the time of the gurus to the present. The transformation of Sikhism would be completed under the last man to carry the title of Guru and who would have the greatest influence on Sikhism since it was founded, Guru Gobind Singh. The Sikhs have been honing their military skills ever since Guru Arjun's death, but they've become caught up in a web of regional politics. The community was threatened from the outside and collapsing from the inside. It was vital that Guru Gobind took decisive action. Guru Gobind Singh felt that Sikhism had to be given a distinct identity. Sikhism, according to him, became a religion of pious householders. And he felt that if a kind of uh, self-esteem was regenerated into the people, certain martial qualities were infused into them, they would be able to protect their rights better. Guru Gobind gathered the Sikhs at his stronghold of Anandpur in the spring of 1699 on Visakhi, the first day of the Indian New Year. In what Sikhs celebrate as the most important event in their history since their religion was founded, Guru Gobind initiated his followers into a new sacred order, the pure or the Khalsa. He stunned his followers. He sent orders that they should come with their hair and beards uncut. And then he had a big cauldron with water. He churned it with a double-edged dagger. Guru Gobind then tested his followers to find out which were the bravest. He said, I want five heads. People are willing to lay down their heads. Five people came up, one after another. Uh, they came from different castes, from different parts of India. And he baptized them as the Khalsa. All Orthodox Sikhs aspire to be initiated into the Khalsa. Five priests representing the original five members of the Khalsa prepare the sweetened baptismal water Amrit. As a sign of unity and equality, all male initiates adopt the surname Singh, meaning lion, and all women the name Kaur or princess. On baptism with the Amrit water, they vow to follow a strict moral code and way of life. The creation of the Khalsa honed and perfected the uh, Sikh identity. Now the idea of the um, Khalsa's creation was that you stand out in a crowd and you don't go around hiding behind bushes. You say, this is who I am, I'm a Khalsa, I'm a Sikh. Come and get me if you want to, but I will not hide. I'll stand for my convictions. Now that had a profound impact on the psyche of the Sikhs, till today. Khalsa initiates also adopt visible symbols known as the five Ks. Kutch, cotton shorts. Kiss, uncut hair, symbolizing acceptance of God's gifts, which is kept tidy by a kanga or comb representing discipline. Men usually cover their hair with a turban. The kara is a steel bracelet which symbolizes unity. And finally, the karban is a small sword representing justice and spiritual power. 
Guru Gobind Singh's aim was no less than to transform the Sikhs into a community of warrior saints. Guru Gobind Singh explains it himself in some of his writing, very moving uh, uh, verses he composed. When all other means have failed, it is righteous to draw the sword. He was fighting against tyranny and he said, I will uproot tyranny from this soil so that righteous people can live. And he fired his people. He said, I'll teach the sparrow to fight the hawk. I'll teach one man to fight a million. And the Khalsa became a kind of the Sikh samurai, uh, a warrior people. The Sikhs rallied following the creation of the Khalsa, but only at a great cost. All four of Guru Gobind Singh's sons were killed, two in battle, and the younger two were executed after they refused to convert to Islam. Gobind Singh himself died after being stabbed. He vested the role in the Sikh's holy book, the Guru Granth Sahib. He dramatically and radically changed the whole concept of leadership. This time it is a book of knowledge that will provide what, we, uh, uh, what, the, what the Sikh community wanted. Well, the Guru Granth Sahib is very, very definitely more than a book. It is a constant source of guidance in moments of sorrow or rejoicing, in moments of tragedy or triumph. The Granth lies in the Harmindar Sahib, the golden temple of Amritsar. Despite its ornate exterior, the temple was carefully designed to reflect the principles of Sikhism. The concept of Sikhism comes across most beautifully and subtly in the planning of the, the Golden Temple. Uh, for instance, normally the temples were, were built on a very high plinth, so you were kind of going up, you had to go up to God. Now here it was supposed to be with that the lowest of the creatures could come to the house of God. So you have the golden temple, which is in the middle of the which is lower than the level of the city outside. The other thing is also the concept of humility, that it is fire that goes upwards, but it is water that goes downwards, a concept that you see in the planning of the golden temple. As the affluence of the Sikhs increased, the temple became more lavish, culminating in a lining of marble and gold this was during the reign of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, itself a golden age for the Sikhs. Ranjit Singh reunited the Sikhs in an empire stretching beyond the Punjab and across northwest India. After Guru Gobind Singh, there was 80 years of absolute turmoil. And then Maharaja Ranjit Singh emerged in the late 18th century and consolidated this entire region. Now, this was a period where there was stability, there was political stability in the region. The man had the most phenomenal vision. So it was during this period, uh, 50 years of his reign, that architecture, art and crafts developed under his patronage. It was very important to have a patron. Ranjit Singh gave the Sikhs their strongest leadership since the days of the Gurus. But when he died, they fell apart. The British, who had conquered much of India, now saw a chance to add the Punjab to their empire. But the Sikhs wouldn't let it go easily. They met the British with ferocious resistance before finally being defeated in 1849. But far from being a disaster for the Sikhs, the arrival of the British would mark a new era. One of the most spectacular monuments to British rule is India Gate in New Delhi, a memorial to the fallen of the Imperial Indian Army. Sikh names dominate the walls. The British had been so impressed by the Sikhs' fighting skills that they recruited large numbers of them as soldiers. By showing a strong respect for Sikh traditions, the British encouraged the Sikhs to think of themselves as a privileged martial race. They realized that the strength of the Sikhs as a soldier lay in their identity as a, a separate community. So whenever battalions were raised or formed, great stress was laid on the Sikh traditions, religious traditions, and the 
background from which a particular soldier came from. And the British officer in the Sikh army made it a point himself to become like his men. He started wearing a color. When he went to a ceremonial parade, he wore the Sikh turban. Uh, on the ceremonial parade, he wore the chakkar on his turban. And if a Sikh soldier was found either clipping his beard or cutting his hair, he was immediately court-martialed and dismissed from service. Sikhs went on to fight and die for the British on battlegrounds from India's northwest frontier to the Flanders fields of World War I. Khalsa Sikhs were also given privileges in other areas of British rule, such as government. Far from diluting Sikh culture, the presence of the British had strengthened it. The Khalsa has always faced the problem of merging back into Hinduism. They give up their hair and beard, they become Hindus believing in Sikhism. Therefore, when the British encouraged this separate Khalsa existence, a kind of hothouse existence, it, it served the purposes of the Khalsa Sikhs. But the Sikhs were soon reminded of the harsher side to British rule. In 1919, just months after the war ended, hundreds of them were massacred at Jallianwala Bagh, a garden near the Golden Temple where they'd been taking part in a peaceful demonstration against British rule. Sikhs now stepped forward in their thousands to join the growing movement for Indian independence. The British government, when they came over there, they were out and out rooting our people. I belong to a peasant family. We were under heavy debts because we cannot pay the land revenue. And paying the land revenue, we had to borrow money from the money lender. And money lending class was snatching our land. Freedom is the birthright of every person. So my country wanted to be free. And my parents, my grandparents, they were fighting for the freedom of this country. I learned from them and joined. The Sikh contribution to the Indian independence movement was more than significant, considering their, um, uh, the percentage of the population and less than 2% of the population. And yet 85% um, of those who were killed or hung by the British during the independence uh, struggle um, 85 percent were six. Now, why did the six contribute so much? Because it is rooted in their tradition of valor, the concept of martyrdom, resistance to tyranny, which springs from that. The British cracked down mercilessly on the independence movement. They sentenced me for a year and sent me to the Rudhyana jail. I was kept in a small cell over there, uh, six by eight and ten feet high. Uh, there I had to make all my call of natures inside that little room. And uh, the season was that uh, uh, dump in June, July. So I got uh, yonders in the cell. Despite such harsh treatment from the British, when World War II broke out, the Sikhs and their fellow Indians provided the Allies with the largest volunteer army ever recruited. I had taken an oath of allegiance uh, to defend the country. I went wherever my regiment was ordered to go. And uh, frankly, I don't see any conflict of interest between the two. British had promised us dominion status at the end of the war. And that word was good enough as far as I was concerned. The Japanese and the Germans had been promising the same thing to us, but we did not know them. The Germans and the Japanese had a very bad track record as colonial powers. And what was there to say? That they may say, now you need another 200 years of civilization before we give you any... By 1946, the British had bowed to the inevitable and were preparing to leave India. 
the Congress Party of Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi jostled with the Muslim League, led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, to decide just what shape a free India would take. But in the meantime, India's six million Sikhs found themselves politically marginalized. In the run-up to independence in 1947, the Sikhs expected that as a sore arm of India, as people whose loyalty and whose um, integrity and whose contribution to India's independence struggle, they expected that their interests would be safeguarded. Well, their interests were not safeguarded. In the negotiations that led up to independence, the Congress Party, the Muslim League, and the British negotiated a plan which completely sacrificed the Sikhs. Once again, at a crucial point in their history, the Sikhs lacked strong leadership. Master Tara Singh, their foremost spokesman, was stronger on rhetoric than he was on politics. He was outmaneuvered by Jinnah, who wanted a separate homeland for Muslims, and by Nehru, who wanted a united India under the leadership of the Congress Party. Sometimes integrity by itself is not enough. You've got to have the savvy, you've got to have shrewdness, and to some extent you've got to be a political crook, but in the best sense of the term, to see through the working of other crooks. But he was unable to do that. The deal brokered by the British Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, was a disaster for the Sikhs. A Muslim homeland called Pakistan would come into being, but to provide territory for the new nation, the Punjab would be split down the middle, with the western half going to Pakistan. Jinnah promised the Sikhs a safe home, but those who'd been living in West Punjab had good reasons to be sptical. I was living in Lahore. I had no intention of leaving. Uh, I thought after the troubles were over, uh, I'd be able to come back. But by May 1947, Lahore was in flames. I saw a large part of the city uh, satellite by Muslim mobs every day. Does not two dozen six were murdered because they could be spotted very easily. There was not much resistance because uh, the police I left Lahore in August, just before independence, because there was absolutely no choice. All Hindus and Sikhs living around me had gone. As partition approached in August 1947, Sikhs headed east, fleeing from the Muslim-dominated West Punjab. In return, Muslims from the east headed west. The Punjab's different religious communities now turned on each other in a frenzy of bloodshed and carnage. I really can't figure out how this barbarity came up. I think a lot of it was misinformation. While rumors were being exaggerated, if a train arrived in Amritsar with 50 killed, the rest of India was told that the whole train had arrived with not one man alive. And perhaps the same thing was, was being repeated on the other side. Uh, but the worst in the human nature came out in both the countries at that time. The refugees displaced by partition made up the largest migration the world had ever seen. The death toll has been estimated at more than a million. A divided Punjab left historic Sikh sites such as Guru Nanak's birthplace in Pakistan. Think of a man who fought for the freedom of a whole country, for whole people. When the partition comes up, what happened to him? You can imagine. That was the most uh, 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 emotional, that was the most uh, dreadful uh, time for me. As India celebrated its independence, the Sikhs reflected on the heavy price they paid. But if they believed that their lives could become settled once the trauma of partition was over, they would be proved sadly wrong. A 
At first, the future looked good. The hard work of Sikh farmers turned Indian Punjab into the most prosperous state in the country. But by the 1970s, many Sikhs felt that their success hadn't been rewarded with political and economic rights. The Punjab even had to share its capital, Jandigarh, with a neighboring state. Sikh politicians demanded greater autonomy. On the 2nd of June, 1984, Mrs. Gandhi finally decided to remove Bindranwale and his men. Rather than sending in the police, she sent in the army during one of the Golden Temple's major religious events. The timing of the assault on the Golden Temple was, in one word, diabolical. Now, don't forget that Punjab at this stage is saturated with intelligence agencies and their agents and moles. Are we expected to believe that they completely overlooked the fact that it's the birth anniversary of the founder of the Golden Temple, Guru Arjun Dev? And, and the time the assault at that time? when pilgrims are coming from all over the world to be there on that hallowed occasion. Inside the complex was Sarinda Kornanda, the wife of the Golden Temple's information officer. We had no idea that the army would attack the Golden Temple because everybody comes to Golden Temple to say their prayers and to bow their heads before the Guru Granth Sahib. A media blackout was imposed as the army readied itself for what it codenamed Operation Blue Star. Visitors to the Golden Temple expect to hear the sound of fireworks during festivals. But this time a different kind of explosion echoed through the skies of Remritsar. We heard the noises of bombardment at Akalta, noises of people dying. They were crying with pain and we heard noises of shoes, shoes of army men entered in the Golden Temple. They entered the Golden Temple along with their shoes. They didn't care for any respect, regard or anything. The army was given permission to fire on the Akal Tak, where Bimranwali was holed up. The tide turned against the militants, but at great cost to the sacred building. Official figures for the fatalities were 83 soldiers and 492 militants and civilians, including 30 women and 5 children. Unofficial estimates went into the thousands. When we came out, we saw lying dead bodies here and there. A bad smell was coming out. I was feeling very sad. Our people... I had attacked uh, Indian people. Yes, our government had attacked Indians. Unu Sikh kade people aati sakhne. Lekin jeda lokraji system de vich jeli sarkar chal rahi hoge, uthe logano dawon le non division pahunch chadi jaave. U chote je complex the. E do vada saade le history ko is sadmani. Bahut dukh hai. The impact of Operation Blue Star was felt across the world as Sikh communities outside of India erupted in outrage at the news. While volunteers cleared up the rubble, Mrs. Gandhi visited the Golden Temple in an attempt to soothe Sikh feelings. She promised to rebuild the damaged complex at the nation's expense. 
but Sikh anger wasn't to be bought off so easily. When Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated, somebody rang me up to tell me what had happened. At that time, I wasn't sure who'd killed her, uh, but soon after, by the afternoon, one learned that it was her own security guards who were both Sikhs. It was at night that mobs started coming round, all on trucks with uh, cans of oil, petrol, matches, and iron rods. There were cab ranks. They were all mainly run by Sikhs. They burnt up their taxi, and I watched the mob come, burn up uh, Sikh shops. There were armed policemen standing by, doing nothing. It was a greater shock for me, because I felt really that this is what a Jew in Nazi Germany must have felt, that I, an Indian, have became a refugee in my own country. Some of the worst violence took place in Trilok Puri, a suburb of Delhi where Sikhs and Hindus lived in close quarters. ਉਹਨੂੰ ਜਬਰਦਸਤੀ ਉੱਤੇ ਬੁਲਾਇਆ ਉੱਤੇ ਬੁਲਾ ਕੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਧੱਕਾ ਦੇ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਉੱਤੋਂ ਸੁੱਟਦਾ ਉੱਤੋਂ ਹੀ ਮਿੱਟੀ ਦਾ ਤੇਲ ਪਾ ਕੇ ਸਰੀਏ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਮਾਰਨ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਫਿਰ ਵੀ ਉਹ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਵੀ ਸੀਗੇ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਚੱਲਿਆ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਲੱਕੇ ਮੈਂ ਤੇ ਥੱਲੇ ਸੰਗੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਚੱਲਿਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਮਿੱਟੀ ਦਾ ਤੇਲ ਪਾ ਕੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਲਾਤਾ ਹੈ ਵੀ ਤਿੱਲੀ ਲਗਾਈ ਹੈ ਤਰਲੇ ਲੈਣ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਉਹ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਛੱਡ ਦਿਓ ਮੇਰਾ ਬੱਚਾ ਇੱਕ ਕੋਈ The Congress party is entirely and completely responsible for what happened in Delhi after Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. The killings, the burnings, the lootings, the rape, that is entirely due to the Congress party. They controlled uh, the uh, federal government in the center and they controlled the Delhi administration. Everything was under them. It would have been stopped in one day. By the time of Mrs. Gandhi's funeral, most of the violence had subsided. But senior members of her Congress party were accused not merely of negligence but of actual complicity in the killings. What was very clear was that there was a certain sort of um, methodology in the way the mobs moved. It was not a random. If Sikh houses are singled out, they had already been listed. And those lists you could get from the Ministry of Property. Which property is where, who's paying, how much tax, what number on what street, who's living. Fifteen years on, many of the widows and orphans from Trilok Puri have been resettled on the other side of Delhi. Official figures put the number killed in the Delhi riots at 2,733, yet only around 150 people have been convicted for the violence. Cases are still ongoing against dozens of prominent Congress party members. <laughs> ਦਰ ਡੇਟ ਦੇ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਪਰੇਸ਼ਾਨ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਸਾਡੇ ਘਰ ਦੇ ਵੀ ਆਦਮੀ ਚੱਲੇ ਗਏ ਤੇ ਕੋਰਟ ਜਾ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਪਰੇਸ਼ਾਨ ਹੋ ਗਏ The tragic repercussions of Operation Blue Star weren't just limited to India but it would be the Canadian Sikhs who paid the highest price 
The community in Vancouver, British Columbia, is one of the oldest in the West City for 100 years. Its history has always been closely interwoven with that of the Sikhs back in India. Even before Indian independence, Vancouver Sikhs had been fighting both for their own rights and those of their fellow Sikhs in India. People from Indian origin were not allowed to vote in British Columbia and therefore we were not allowed to practice at the bar, we couldn't go into any profession, and it made it very difficult. We formed an East Indian Youth Association, which took a great deal of participation and pride in the fact that we were working for the freedom of India and for our rights in the franchise here in British Columbia. Canadian Sikhs, who had triumphed over racial and economic barriers, committed both their money and their families to the Indian independence movement. Well, mother and father both um, had made up their minds that if they had any children, they were going to be doctors, they were going to go back to India and serve in the villages, in their village. And... Um, uh, the other thing was that they were going to go into the freedom movement and help to free India. And we were brought up with that. There was no question in our minds that that's what we were going to do. The campaigning paid off. Less than a month after India's independence, Indians living in British Columbia won the right to vote. Canada has since become a popular destination for Sikh migrants, especially after immigration policies were liberalized during the 1960s. No other children. Attitudes within the community have also changed. In the 70s, people came who had been schooled, who had also lived and grown up after India became independent and they had different expectations from those that had come earlier. I think people who had come earlier were simply happy to be here. They struggled for our rights, uh, struggled for equality, but they weren't as strident, uh, weren't as aggressive, uh, weren't as uh, demanding. Just how vocal Canadian Sikhs could be was clear following the raid on the Golden Temple. We were in the uh, Gurdwara when we got this news that the Golden Temple has been attacked by the Indian government and there was a lot of people inside the Gurdwara and uh, all the congregation was stunned to learn this news and everybody was in shock. We were trying to organize the Sikh community to do something to lessen their griefs. The government responded by plunging a massive security force into Punjab. The authorities earned a notorious reputation for human rights violations. Ordinary Sikhs now feared both criminals and the police. During those years, uh, we got to know firsthand what it must be like to live in a police state. And uh, as, you, as you went along the roads, there was police everywhere and they were pointing guns, on, pointing at you. As you were going along, sometimes I wonder what would happen if it just went off accidentally. It was horrible, and it was scary. Although recent years have seen peace return to the Punjab, it may be too soon to judge whether the conflict is over for good. I don't know of any instance in history, or more recent times, where police brutality brings about solves uh, or resolves uh, uh, political issues. It hasn't worked in Punjab, therefore. There's no way that we can assume that Punjab is now completely at peace because below the surface, the same resentments emerge. Many of the grievances are unaddressed. Those who have lost their lives through police measures and police brutality, their families and others are now added to those who already had grievances. Many Sikhs abroad hope that democratic means can now be used to influence events in India. The Canadian Parliament already has three Sikh MPs and 1997 saw the appointment of the first Sikh cabinet minister, Harbans Singh Daliwal. Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I've articulated to all the governments in India about human rights and how important it is, particularly if you look at the Delhi riots in India, I said those people should be brought to justice, they were responsible for the Delhi rights. In terms of the extrajudicial killing in the Punjab, 
I've spoken up as a member of parliament saying that uh, human rights is very important. I strongly believe that uh, economic prosperity is linked to human rights. Canada's Sikh community is still dealing with its internal differences. Recent vocal disputes over temple management have attracted unfavorable attention, as did the murder last year of a popular Sikh newspaper editor by an unidentified attacker. Well, the Sikhs have always learned that they must work hard, and there's always barriers and difficulties they've learned throughout their history, and you have to deal with them. I think the things they've learned that Guru Nanak told us, that how important hard work is, how important helping each other is, all those things uh, will help the community. In Amritsar, preparations are nearly complete to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the Khalsa. The Khalsa was created to ensure the community's survival through difficult and dangerous times. Yet the last 15 years have seen some of the gravest crises Sikhism has had to face. Sikhism has always emerged very fine and strong whenever there has been a challenge, either from within or from without. And I'm sure that they will be able to put behind them the events of the 1980s and emerge finer and stronger and continue to lead the people. If we were able to ensure two things, that we only elect men with a strong ideological base and a vision to be our leaders, Many Sikhs feel the time has come to once again revitalize their community. For the two million Sikhs who live away from the spiritual homeland of Punjab in India, maintaining a Sikh identity on foreign shores has its own challenges. I see a lot of confusion about the generation gap between parents and children, you know, the people the potential Sikhs for tomorrow. You can't be both British and Sikh because they clash. One's a certain lifestyle, one's another lifestyle. You do start questioning, you know, what are you about? You know, why do I look different? Why are people asking me questions and I don't know the answers to them? I have been a Sikh all of my life. I just didn't realize that there was a Sikh religion or An English churchyard is the unlikely resting place for Britain's first known Sikh settler, the son of the last great ruler of Punjab. The story of the life of Maharaja Dilip Singh is ultimately and sadly a tragic one. Maharaja Dilip Singh ended up coming to England as a result of the British annexation of his kingdom of Punjab. And he came here at an age of 15 years. He was, after all, the last ruler of the Sikhs and the son of the legendary and powerful Maharaja Ranjit Singh. The British, at a time of great imbalance in Punjab and in India generally, did not want the Sikhs to become a focus for opposition to the British rule. And it was in their interest to keep her in Punjab. Dilip Singh lived in comfortable exile on the Elverdin estate in Suffolk. His distance from India further emphasized by his adoption of Christianity. It's clear that he was veered very strongly towards Christianity by the British administration so that he would lose contact with his own community and that he would live the life of an Englishman. Later in his life, as he realized what had been taken from him, he took a great interest in his faith and all the records show that prior to his death, he re-embraced Sikhism. Dulip Singh's image has been adopted by British Sikhs as a potent symbol of their own identity. He was, by all accounts, the first Sikh settler in this country. But it's what he symbolizes beyond that. He symbolizes a link between Punjab and Britain. So for generations of, of Sikhs in Britain, um, he can assume a very important role.
unlike Gulif Singh, most of today's half a million Sikhs are in the country by choice. But their history has still not been an easy one. Sikhs first began coming to Britain in significant numbers in the 1950s, when news of a labour shortage following the Second World War reached the villages of Punjab. They were joined in the early 70s by Sikhs who had fled East Africa because of political instability. They came here for all the tough jobs like working in foundries, in factories, in mills. Uh, it was hard, they came mainly singly and then they began to settle. I came to England in 1962 because we heard a lot of good stories about England that it is a land of opportunity and it is a land of future. When I reached here in England, I was wearing turban. But my colleagues and my uncle, first thing they told me that, look, you have to cut your hair down and you have to take your turban off, otherwise you won't get work. With the majority of the community, the native community in this country, the turban was something that uh, they considered uh, superfluous. Why should people look different? Uh, that was the general attitude. So we had these arguments in the field. Why should people to wear uh, a turban if there were bus drivers or bus conductors? Why should Sikh children want to wear a turban instead of the school uniform? Tarsam Singh Sandhu worked in a factory before finding a job on the buses in 1966. It was then he decided to return to his beard and turban. I thought, whatever happened, I want to be what I am. I want to be what my identity is. And uh, it is part of my religion. I must wear it. But his manager suspended him, saying that his turban wasn't a part of his uniform and he could only return to work if he removed it. There was a lot of uproar in the Asian community. They organized demonstrations in Wolverhampton, in London, at different times. It was taken to first to local uh, authority, then to MPs, then to House of Parliament. After two years, it was allowed that Sikhs can wear turban on the buses. Britain is now home to the largest community of Sikhs outside India. But while their parents may have fought to maintain a traditional Sikh identity, many of today's British-born Sikhs have reservations about the orthodox or Khalsa way of life. In my eyes, you can't be both British and Sikh at the same time. From what I've seen in my experiences growing up, I've seen people mocked and things like that for wearing turban. I've seen people not accepted as much. I like to go out. I like to socialise. I like to have a moderate drink. I like to just basically have a good time. I and mean, then that is in complete contrast with living life as a Sikh. Having a turban and things like that, in my eyes, would have slowed me down by now. I was brought up in a Sikh family and I feel very grateful that when I was going through for all my school age years, and my, my father didn't, didn't pressure anything too drastic about Sikhism on me. He didn't force me to go to the Godwara. He didn't force me to do that. He didn't force me. So I feel so grateful for that. <laughs> At the God where I see very old people and I see very young people, but I don't really see many people who my history. I think that's mainly because the older generation, they can understand it a lot more. What's stopping young Sikhs going to the God is basically many of them cannot speak Punjabi. And if they do, it's not a level of what they speak at home. You know, they go there and they see this guy with a big beard and white clothes and and he's really not on their sort of wavelength. Shira Kaur was baptised into Sikhism at an Amrit ceremony two years ago. Before I took Amrit, I was a rebellious teenager. I drank and went through all kinds of phases in life. By taking Amrit, what I've achieved is a purpose to life where I know that all my actions have a meaning.
When I look around me and see young people um, who are Asians, and I see a lot of Punjabis, unfortunately, not only, you know, one in a couple of thousand you actually see a Sikh, you know, that quality, that spirit inside people, unfortunately, is declining. What worries me about Sikh youth in the future is that, unfortunately, you see, marbles on my marbles are going to use it going to a gig than you would people queuing to go inside and pay their respects to Sikh temple. A common passion shared by most young Sikhs, whether orthodox or not, is Bhangra, pop music based on Punjabi folk rhythms. Me and my friends enjoy going to Bhangra gigs because being Sikh, we have an identity to be there. We have like a place. Being Punjabi, you can understand the lyrics and you understand the sound, the, the drums, you, you can, you feel, uh, there's a tradition and culture there which is just, you don't see in every club and that's why I go to Bangladesh. The problem we have is that youngsters think that the Punjabi way of life and the Sikh way of life are more or less the same thing, where well, they're not. There's a clear distinction and a line to be drawn between the two. The qualities of the culture which represent purity. Those trying to keep young British Sikhs within the faith have made it their main strategy to catch them while they're young. The tenth prophet of the Sikhs, Guru Gobind Raji, called everyone... From my own experience, I think there's, there is a real need to actually... Um, at least to present Sikhism to a younger audience so that they can make a choice. I'm involved in workshops that go on up and down the country, um, which are all done on a voluntary basis to try to educate young Sikhs who may not have the, the teaching or the environment at home to actually give them the fullest understanding of Sikhism. Very quick. What we need to do as, as young Sikhs that are active on the ground today is really represent um, all of the, the whole uh, panorama of, of Sikh beliefs, so Sikh religious beliefs, Sikh culture, uh, Sikh heritage and Sikh history. And we need to present that in a medium and in, a ve in vehicles that are well understood. We tend to um, frequent all the, the antique arcades and places such as Port Vera Market, Camden Market up in London, um, really searching for anything of interest to Sikhs. Have a look down there. Uh -huh. There's some nice pieces. There's a couple of customers looking at the moment. But okay. A lot of British officers and a lot of British um, serving men would come back to England with things brought back from the Punjab and from other parts of India. These are really modern maps. We're not going to get into this. Uh, uh, ah. Watch this. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, Indian troops sort of for service in Europe. Night to Bengal Cavalry. I never knew about what it meant to be sick until I think about, about a hit university. And that's when you do start questioning, you know, what, what are you about? You know, why do I look different? Why are people asking me questions and I don't know the answers to them? Uh, and so it's really then that I started to, to find out more and more about what the Sikh religion's about, what our heritage is, what the values are, and the history, etc. There's a, a later edition by the British. Amandeep's yes. interest in Sikh history has led him to become involved in the prestigious exhibition of Sikh arts at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. English sure. 30 years ago, we never have dreamt of having a, a very British institution, a very imperial institution, like the Indian NAD, celebrating with us the 300th anniversary of, of the birth of the Khalsa. Um, so I think what we're, what we're seeing now is, is very much um, seats in the, the ascendancy in this country. Or, at, a certain point, at certain ranges, he would have to... I think the Sikhs of my generation should really try to address the issues that are facing young Sikhs in Britain today, um, for example, um, the idea of getting a job in, in the city uh, in a prof as a professional. Um, many Sikhs think that they can't get into the city, but that's obviously not true because there are many people like myself who have made it into the city and are doing, you know, on a relatively, doing relatively well for themselves. Okay. If you see um, Rob Louise or Mark, can you just let them know that I'm in the canteen waiting for them for the meeting? Thanks. I'm currently training to be a chartered accountant frequently um, yeah, you walk in and you're introduced to the clients for the first time by the managers on the job and there's all, sometimes you get the look of oh my god watch this um, which is quite quite I'm used to it so it's not really a problem for me to deal with um, but it's just interesting to see the reaction on people's faces and then you get the, 
the, the moments when the ice breaks and then come out of the question when you just they're yeah. holding up inside for two or three weeks and they finally muster up the courage to say, you know, so what's the turban about? What is the beard about? And then you can have quite a good conversation, you know, drop a few points and so on. And, and it opens up a whole new avenue and a whole new understanding. So next time they meet a Sikh, they can say, oh, I know this about Sikhs. But the exposure of Westerners to Sikhs has also produced one of the most unexpected events in Sikhism in recent years, a movement of white Sikh converts based in the United States. Inhale, hold the breath and slowly bring your hands overhead till the thumb tips meet. Exhale and set yourself down for victory pose, arms straight out for balance. Legs up at an angle and your body in a V. Look straight ahead this time. Focus on your big toe as you wreck fire powerfully, rapidly. The first thing that really drew me to Sikhism was the idea that, that God is within, not without. I'd always kind of pictured God from my mother and, and other influences as this great white-haired man sitting on top of a cloud just waiting for me to come up at the end of my life. and. I'd never had that personal experience, but I'd also always felt, even as a small child, that it was more of what was inside of me that was more important. Sikhism was the one of the first religions that I found that that really believed as I did that God is God is within me and it's within everyone around me, and to recognize that in everyone and not be judgmental in that. Once plain Jeffrey Scott Anderson, Jay Qatar, began his spiritual search as a U.S. Army sergeant during the Panama invasion. I had bullets flying by my head and kind of dodging cars and trying to enter buildings and things like that and, and people getting shot and it suddenly made me realize that I could, I could actually die. I'm only 23 years old but I could actually die and so I started really after that experience trying to find out what it was that I believed in. What happens when I die? You know, where do I go from here and how does that affect how I live now? Jay Qatar was introduced to Sikhism through the Healthy, Happy, Holy Organization of 3HO, founded in America in the late 60s by Harbhajan Singh Khalsa, also known to his followers as Yogi Bhajan. The core principle of this teaching is to give people experience and deep understanding which they can feel that there is a higher life, higher self, and higher excellence in them. We can't say this is right or this is wrong. All we are saying, all is right where you can get the experience. And if we can provide them practical living experience, my tradition tells me and commands me to one thing, let no person go spiritually hungry. And if he's a Christian, God bless him. If he's a Jew, God bless him. And if he's a Hindu, God bless him. If he's a Sikh, God bless him. My parents reacted to me converting to Sikhism actually with a lot of grace. My mother has always been very supportive of, of who I am, but she's also always had a very big fear of, of cults growing up. And so her first, her first question to me was, after a long period of silence, was, well, will they let you out? When you want to get out, and I was like, "Yes, Mom. Though you know, we, I'm not being held against my will here, and not being brainwashed." She and started started asking, asking me my questions. She said, "Well, you know, do you? What do you believe? How do you believe about God?" And I was like, "Well, I, I believe this and this." And she's like, "Well, I, I believe that." And so, why do you wear a turban? Well, I do it for this reason. Well, I believe in that. So she started seeing the similarities between how she thought, and I really told her, "I said, Mom." You know, you've, without even knowing about it, you've raised me to be a Sikh all my life. And the truth is, as a good friend of mine put very well, that I have been a Sikh all of my life. I just didn't realize that there was actually a religion or a word for it. Jay Qatar now runs a security firm in New Mexico, along with other Sikh converts. And what you may find out is that they think they need, they're worried about somebody breaking into their place, but what their real their real liability is, is their computer security. If we're packaging that, 99% of the time I get 
an incredible positive reaction from people. All of a sudden they realize that I'm not here to convert them into Sikhism and I'm a normal person. They start asking questions if they've never heard about Sikhism before. Or they, you know, I had a Sikh friend back in in college. I've never heard of that. And so, so it's, it, to me, it's a bridge uh, for people to to really escape from their comfort zone and expand their horizons and start to look at more of their environment around them. The security firm is one of several businesses and welfare projects run by the Sikhs from their main community in Española, New Mexico, founded by Yogi Bhajan in 1970. I went all over the world. I feel God lives everywhere, but his postbus address is Española. The weather, the height of this place, and the people, and it is just like our Punjab, you know, here you do not feel that you live out of Punjab. It's just a village of Punjab. What I found in the community here in Española was, were more of the tools and the support systems that I, that I have a feeling of comfort instead of separation from my environment. The access to my teacher, the access to Yogi Bhajan was very important to me. You always use it, so-and-so is dumb. This is a dumb condition. What do you mean by that? What is the purpose of communication? What is the purpose of talking? The people love me for my wisdom, wisdom is the way, and if they hate me for my foolishness, they have every right. But it's not a setup. I'm not, I'm His Holiness, Sri Singh Sa, Pai Sa, Varpanjan Singh, Father Yogi Ji, but I'm not His Holiness in the sense that my word is final, or my advice is final, or my opinion is final. Every opinion must have objection. Objection, opinion is meted out. And truthful, truthfully, I want these people to challenge things so that they can learn and become learned, and tomorrow you can face the world at their own. Because I am there yesterday, and they are my tomorrow. Sikhism has never been a, a missionary faith. It's never gone out there to, to actively find converts. So when Yogi Bhajan started converting into the Padawan forms in the early 70s, I think it had a really uncomfortable fit with the wider Sikh community. What's very interesting about them, though, and what's very refreshing about them as a, them as a people is that they don't have the, the Punjabi or the very Indian hang-ups that, that um, Sikhs, the wider Sikh community actually has. So they bring quite a refreshing and, and, and crisp notion of what Sikh belief actually is. And I think we can learn quite a lot from that. But while Sikhs may be finding inspiration in the West, the quality of leadership from their spiritual home of Amritsar in India has left many disappointed. The leadership of the Sikh community in Amritsar has no direct responsibility or authority to tell Sikhs outside the country of how they should interpret their religion or how they should live their religion. And yet, because of the nature of Amritsar being the spiritual home for many Sikhs, for Sikhs generally, uh, we do look there for guidance and advice. Uh, we don't get it, sadly. For Sikhs in any country, the festival of Vasaki remains the most important date in the calendar. This year's celebrations also mark the 300th anniversary of the Khalsa and are providing a useful opportunity for the community to reflect on where it's come since the first Sikh baptism in 1699. <laughs> We are really in an evolving phase right now and a lot of the issues that we're facing are, are products of the fact that we are discovering for the first time that you know we have a community in the diaspora. We're not living in Punjab, we're living in England. I mean true right, this, this is England and England has its own culture and tradition and heritage and if we're going to live here, I don't mean we have to adopt it fully, I mean we're going to we're gonna have to adapt. I do enjoy being a Sikh. I mean, the, the, I think the main advantage to being a Sikh is that I've got access to possibly the world's greatest teachings on life. Um, what 
the things that the Guru's actually said, um, you'll, f you'll find dotted around other religions and faiths, and it's really the best of all of those accumulated into one. Sikhism has unfortunately been hidden away from the rest of the world and away from uh, many Sikhs. But now that we come to the eve of the 21st century, I feel that here's a religion that's been waiting these 500 years to be discovered because here's the guidance that it offers. It offers guidance not for the 16th or 15th century so much as guidance for the 21st century, for the problem of human rights, to further equality between human beings. Khalsa gave us a meaning, a beginning, and an identity. At the moment, we're still evolving and developing. And we, as young Sikhs, what we need to do is take and draw upon that message and actually put that into our personal life and make a difference. <laughs>